Conceptual frameworks are an essential element in most, if not all, social science research. A strong conceptual framework enhances the quality of your research and the way in which it is communicated. Conceptual frameworks are often associated to quantitative research, but guess what? They can also be very important in qualitative research. In order to use the conceptual frameworks effectively, you will have to learn how to develop them. And in order to be able to develop strong frameworks, you should develop your skills in several areas, including the characteristics of a good framework, the types of frameworks that exist, and how frameworks can be used in research. In this video, I'll explain some of these areas in relation to both quantitative and qualitative conceptual frameworks. My goal is to help you understand how conceptual frameworks should be used to guide your research design, analysis, and writing. I'll cover what a conceptual framework is, how conceptual frameworks can be used in quantitative and qualitative research, and I'll explain my favorite type of framework that many of my students also use. And all is supported by examples, as it is common practice in this channel. So if you're interested in conducting effective and meaningful research, keep watching. So what is a conceptual framework? Simply put, a conceptual framework is a framework of concepts. But perhaps more importantly, a conceptual framework should consider two components, the concepts themselves and the relationships between those concepts. The best way of looking at a conceptual framework is to see them as a lens, a lens that we can use to observe real-world phenomena. And this is well encapsulated in Hill's 2001 quote, which says that the heart of scholarship is perspective, theoretical perspective, for the theoretical model of the practitioner is the lens that mediates all observations. In practice, this means that depending on the lens that you are going to choose, you are going to observe the phenomenon in a certain way. If you were to use two different lenses, you would see the same object, the same phenomenon, in two different ways. Conceptual frameworks are very important in research, whether quantitative or qualitative, because they can be used in many ways. Or in other words, they can help you to fulfill many of the expectations underlying high-quality research. Conceptual frameworks are commonly associated to quantitative research, and this is because this type of research is all about examining the relationship between variables. And this is the essence of a conceptual framework, the variables and their relationships. In quantitative research, conceptual frameworks provide a clear and organized roadmap for studying a specific phenomenon and can be used in six ways. Identifying variables and their relationships, developing research questions and hypotheses, inform questionnaire design, designing data analysis, define or refine objectives, and generalization. In qualitative research, conceptual frameworks provide structure and organization to the research process and can be used to guide data collection, to represent data, to structure the data analysis chapter, and also to refine or define objectives. We won't have time to cover all these uses in this video, and therefore I'm going to cover one use for each type of research. For quantitative conceptual frameworks, I'll cover the first and arguably the most important use, identifying variables and their relationships. Let's look at an example. The example of a quantitative conceptual framework comes from this article entitled From Tourist Experience to Satisfaction and Loyalty, Exploring the Role of a Sense of Wellbeing. From looking at the title, we sense that the core concept is a sense of well-being, but there are other concepts that feature in the title, and they are tourist experience, tourist satisfaction, and tourist loyalty. So from the title, we can identify that from a conceptual perspective, there are four concepts being considered by this research. If we delve uh, deeper into the paper and uh, the abstract and then the uh, full paper, we see the relationship between these four concepts. And the relationship is as follows. So we do have tourist well-being as kind of the core uh, element. And then we've got two consequences of tourist well-being, 
tourist satisfaction and tourist loyalty, and one antecedent of tourist well-being, the tourist experience. From a conceptual perspective, the article goes a bit further in clarifying the conceptual framework. In particular, it clarifies how it conceptualizes the concept of tourist experience. In this instance, tourist experience is conceptualized as being made up of four subconcepts, if we want to call them that. Those four areas are uh, education, high aesthetics, entertainment and escapism. The framework also establishes the relationship between two variables, in this instance, tourist satisfaction and loyalty, stating that tourist satisfaction influences loyalty. For qualitative research, the use that I'm going to explain is how conceptual frameworks can be used to structure the data analysis chapter. This example comes from a dissertation, an excellent dissertation that I supervised a few years back on the techniques, outputs and outcomes of circulation management at exhibitions. From the uh, framework, it was fairly straightforward to actually organize the data analysis chapter. Let's see how this works in practice. So if we look at the table of contents, it starts with 4.1, the outcomes, which refers to the top part of the conceptual framework. And because there are two main uh, components in that top part, the uh, outcomes part, the uh, table of contents reflects those two elements. So 4.1.1 are the organizer outcomes and 4.1.2 are the client outcomes. Section 4.2 in the table of contents refers to the outputs. And then you have uh, uh, subsections for each of the seven specific outputs. Section 4.3 is about the techniques, and in this instance, uh, the techniques covering the four types of uh, techniques, magnet, layout, curiosity, and playfulness, and guiding techniques. And uh, section 4.4 is about the other box in the framework, in this instance, the factors influencing the employment of techniques. So imagine yourself, you're analyzing the data and then uh, you create a conceptual framework like this. And then you need to think about how am I going to structure and write my data analysis chapter? If the conceptual framework has been formulated, well designed, it's a fairly straightforward process as this example illustrates. If you're enjoying this video, press the like button. And if you're not subscribed, consider subscribing so that we can grow the community. And if you've got any questions about designing a conceptual framework, you can ask them in the comments. I'll do my best to answer them, and maybe I'll even do a video around it. In order to be able to use conceptual frameworks effectively, you must develop a good framework. But what does a good framework look like? In practice, this means that your framework should meet eight important criteria. And these criteria are basically the same for quantitative and qualitative research, though there are some small differences, which I'll highlight next. And in the virtual tutor resource, I explain these characteristics in detail, supported by examples. For quantitative research, these eight characteristics are the uh, framework should provide a clear and explicit structure for the problem being considered. The framework should clearly define and conceptualize its concepts or uh, variables. The uh, relationships between concepts are logical, relevant, and expressed in a comprehensible manner. The uh, concepts or variables are soundly selected. These uh, concepts or variables are expressed schematically, supported by an accompanying explanation. The framework should portray the essential without reducing the problem to a meaningless minimum. This is the uh, dilemma between parsimony and reductionism. Parsimony means that you should uh, um, describe and represent the phenomenon using as fewer concepts and relationships as possible. But sometimes if we become very parsimonious, we become too reductionist in the sense that we remove important variables or relationships that would have helped to represent the phenomenon better. The seventh characteristic is that the concepts can be operationalized, very important in quantitative research because the essence of quantitative research is that we measure the concepts and to measure them, we have to operationalize them. 
And the final one is that the framework is generic enough to be applicable across a range of situations and contexts. As far as qualitative research, the first six characteristics are exactly the same. With regards to the final two ones, they are similar but slightly different in the sense that instead of the concepts uh, um, being operationalized, is that the framework contributes to theory development because that's one of the key uh, functions of qualitative research. It's to develop theories and therefore the conceptual framework needs to address uh, that expectation of qualitative research. And the final one is similar but also slightly different in the sense that qualitative conceptual frameworks need to be generic enough to be transferable to different situations and contexts. In qualitative research, we don't talk about application, we talk about transferability. These characteristics provide a good starting point when developing your framework, whether it is uh, a qualitative or quantitative. And we can bear these in mind when evaluating how good our framework is. As we are developing, we need to have some reference points that will help us to understand if our framework is good or not. These eight characteristics do that. So as you go, you can ask the question, to what extent does our framework meet these characteristics? For example, we know that uh, conceptual frameworks should portray the essential without reducing the problem to a meaningless minimum. It's the issue of parsimony versus redu reductionism. So we can ask the questions, is there anything missing? Could we do without something in the framework? For example, by removing it outright or merging it with another concept? These are questions that we need to bear in mind as we develop our framework, whether quantitative or qualitative, so that we meet this important criterion related to designing a good framework. Conceptual frameworks are so important in research that I have created two video collections, one focusing on quantitative and the other one focusing on qualitative conceptual frameworks. As of the day of recording this video, you will already access over 75 minutes of content for each type of framework, quantitative and qualitative. You can buy the Conceptual Frameworks uh, video collection on its own or as part of the virtual tutor resource. Go to www.thisstation.academy to find out more about these video collections and all the other video resources available for purchase. In the website, you will also find details about how to get my personalized support, including through one-to-one -one or small group support. It's now time to explain my favorite conceptual framework. And the uh, essence of the framework is that we establish a main concept that we are interested in. And from here, we can identify two sets of variables that relate to the main concept. The first one are the antecedents or what influences the main concept. And the second one are the consequences, what is influenced by the main concept. Now I'm using the words antecedents and consequences, but the literature often uses different words to refer to the same thing. And as far as antecedents, you will see sometimes the word uh, um, determinants, inputs, causes, requirements, stimuli, predictors, influences. These words all refer to the same thing, what influences a concept. As far as the consequences is concerned, you will see words like reactions, outcomes and responses. Again, these are the same as consequences because they refer to what is influenced by a concept. Now, this is a simplified version of the antecedents and consequences framework. And in the uh, video collections, I'll explain the full version in detail. From this framework, we can identify four areas that we can research. The first one is the main concept itself. Sometimes we are just interested in exploring the main concept, not its antecedents, not its consequences. Sometimes what we are interested in is in exploring the relationship between antecedents and main concept. At other times, it's the relationship between main concept and consequences that we want to research. And sometimes we want to research everything. We want to research both the um, main concept, the relationship between antecedents and main concept, and 
the relationship between main concept and consequences. Let's look at some examples to see how this generic framework translates into practice. The first the quantitative uh, conceptual framework example uh, researches the relationship between antecedents and main concept. The uh, focus of the dissertation is on effective communication and in this instance the student was interested in researching the antecedents of effective communication or as the student called it the factors influencing effective communication. And upon researching the literature the student identified many factors that could uh, influence effective communication and she chose a few technological factors, organizational structure and individual attributes. From the framework we can actually see how well it matches the title of the dissertation because the title of the dissertation was the factors influencing project managers effective communication in geographically distributed teams. Geographically distributed teams are teams that are not in the same physical location and therefore they have to communicate uh, in other ways than in person. The important uh, element here is that the framework clearly identifies the variables, the relationships between the variables and adopts the antecedents consequences framework. In this instance, just looking at the antecedents of a concept, which is effective communication. The second example relates to the consequences of a main concept and the example comes from a dissertation entitled An Examination of the Relationship Between Networking Event Satisfaction and Digital Creatives Attachment and Loyalty to a Place. So the key concept here is networking event satisfaction and the two consequences that were defined for the study are place attachment and effective communication. And then through reviewing these two concepts, the student defined them as place identity, place dependence and social bonding, uh, which are categories or elements of place attachment and intention to stay, uh, word of mouth uh, ad or advocacy and place preference, which are elements of effective communication. The first qualitative conceptual framework example focuses on the relationship between antecedents and the main concept and it comes from a dissertation entitled An Exploration of the Techniques Employed by Event Managers to Create Prestige Value at Virtual Events. So we've got two elements here, techniques and prestige value. What the student was seeking to do is to understand what influences the creation of prestige value. And uh, the student identified five categories of techniques which she represented through this kind of Roman temple, the pillars of creating prestige value. She labeled them as uh, visual, content, structural, communication and access techniques. And then inside each of the pillars, she included the individual techniques belonging to each of those categories. So in this instance, the study is on the relationship between antecedents and the concept of interest, prestige, value. The second example is about the relationship between main concept and consequences. And in this instance, the uh, dissertation is entitled Attendees' Reactions to Security Measures at Music Festivals. So we've got two elements, security measures and the reactions or the consequences to these security measures. The way she, the student represented the, the um, reactions was by dividing them into three categories, cognitive reactions, affective reactions, and behavioral uh, reactions. And then she divided the reactions into whether they relate to entering the um, venue, so security measures deployed while visitors, guests are entering the venue or while they are inside the venue already. So for each of the cognitive, affective and behavioral reactions, the reactions were divided into these categories. From a conceptual design perspective, this is clearly an example of an antecedents and consequences framework and more specifically, one that focuses on the relationship between the main concept, security measures, and its consequences. If you want to know more about the qualitative research, check this video 
And if you want to know more about quantitative research, check this one out.